Hello and welcome to episode 7 of our Sharima series here on League Lore and More. Today we will be discussing the champion Talia, known as the Stone Weaver. So this is our second straight um, female character that we'll be discussing on the podcast. Um, And I think that will be, there won't be another one until our next... Uh, our next series. I don't think there's any more female characters for Sharima. And on that note, um, we only have probably three more weeks, two or three more weeks of characters that we're going to discuss uh, regarding Sharima. And then we will wrap things up and then we'll probably have a couple of in-between episodes uh, talking about other stuff keeping true to our name of league lore and more uh, and then jumping into our second unit of of lore uh, our second region and all the champions in that which uh, has yet to be decided um, but i've kind of narrowed it down to uh, a couple that i'm i won't say right now but that's where we're at as far as the trajectory of the podcast and so without uh, further ado, um, let's jump into the story of Talia. Need to break some new ground. Literally. Every tapestry begins with a single stitch. Forgive me, but this uh, biography is a bit lengthy. But anyway. Talia the Stone Weaver. Talia is a nomadic mage from Sharima who weaves stones with energetic enthusiasm and raw determination. Torn between teenage wonder and adult responsibility, she has crossed nearly all of Valorant on a journey to learn the true nature of her growing powers. Compelled by rumors of the rise of a long-dead emperor, she returns to protect her tribe from dangers uncovered by Shirima's shifting sands. Some have mistaken her tender heart for weakness and paid the price for their error. For beneath Talia's youthful demeanor is a will strong enough to move mountains and a spirit fierce enough to make the earth tremble. Born in the rocky foothills bordering Acathia's corrupted shadow, Tilia spent her childhood herding goats with her tribe of nomadic weavers. Where most outsiders see Sharima as a beige and barren waste, her family raised her to be a true daughter of the desert and to see beauty in the rich hues of the land. Tilia was always fascinated by the stone beneath the dunes. When she was a toddler, she collected colorful rocks as her people followed the seasonal waters. As she grew older, the earth itself seemed drawn to her arcing and twisting to follow her tracks through the sand. After her sixth high summer, Talia wandered from the caravan in search of a lost goatling that had been placed in her charge. Determined not to disappoint her father, the master shepherd and headman of the tribe, she tracked the young animal into the night. She followed the hoofprints through a dry wash to a box canyon. The little beast had managed to get high up on the rock wall but could not get down. The sandstone called to her, urging her to pull handholds from the sheer wall. Talia laid a tentative palm against the rock, determined to rescue the scared animal. The elemental power she felt was as urgent and overwhelming as a monsoon rain. As soon as she opened herself to the magic, it poured over her, the stone leaping to her fingertips, bringing both the canyon wall and the beast down on top of her. The next morning, Talia's panicked father tracked the skittish bleats of the goatling. He fell to his knees when he found his daughter unconscious, covered loosely in a blanket of woven stone. Grief-stricken, he returned to the tribe with Talia. Two days later, the girl awoke from fevered dreams in the tent of Baba Yan, the t- tribe's grandmother. Talia began to tell the wise woman and her concerned parents of her night in the canyon, of the rock that called to her. Baba Yan consoled the family, telling them that the patterns of rock were evidence of the great weaver the desert tribe's mythical protector, watched over the girl. In that moment, Talia saw her parents' deep worry and decided to conceal what really happened that night, that she, not the great weaver, had pulled at the desert stone. When Talia, when children in Talia's tribe were old enough, they performed a dance under the face of the full moon, the manifestation of the great weaver herself. The dance celebrated the children's innate talents and demonstrated demonstrated the gifts they would bring to the tribe as adults. This was the start of their path to true learning, as those children then became apprenticed to their teachers. 
Tilia continued to hide her growing power, believing the secret she carried was a danger, not a blessing. She carried as her childhood playmates spun wool. I'm sorry, I misspoke. She watched as her childhood playmates spun wool to keep the tribe warm on cold desert nights. Demonstrated their skill with shears and dye or wolf patterns that told stories of her people. On those nights, she would lie awake long after the coals had burned to ash, tormented by the power she felt stirring within. The time finally came for Tilia's dance beneath the full moon. While she had talent enough to be a capable shepherd like her father, or a patterned mistress like her mother, the young girl dreaded what her dance would truly reveal. As Tilia took her place on the sand, the tools of her people, the shepherd's crook, the spindle, and the loom, surrounded her. She tried to concentrate on the task at hand but it was the distant rocks, the layered colors of the land that called to her. Talia closed her eyes and danced. Overwhelmed by the power flowing through her, she began to spin, not thread, but the very earth beneath her feet. Startled cries from Talia's tribe broke her out of her spell. An imposing braid of sharp rock beneath reached up to the light of the moon. Talia looked at the shocked faces of the people who surrounded her. Her will over the stone broken, the earth and tapestry crashed down. Tilia's mother ran to her only daughter to protect her from the falling rock. When the dust finally settled, Tilia saw the destruction she had woven, the alarm on the faces of her tribe, but it was a small cut across her mother's face that justified Tilia's fear. Though the cut was minor, Tilia knew in that moment that she was a threat to the people she loved most in the world. She ran into the night, so weighed down by despair that the ground trembled beneath her feet. It was her father who found her again in the desert. As they sat in the light of the rising sun, Talia confessed her secret in choking sobs. In turn, he did the only thing a parent could do. He hugged his daughter tightly. He told her that she couldn't run from her power, that she must complete her dance and see where her path would take her. Turning her back on the great weaver's gift was the only danger that could truly break his and her mother's heart. Talia returned with her father to the tribe. She entered the dancer's circle with her eyes open. This time she wove a new ribbon of stone, each color and texture a memory of the people surrounding her. When it was over, the tribe sat in awe. Talia waited nervously. It was time for one of her people to stand as her teacher and claim the student. What felt like eons stretched between Talia's hammering heartbeats. She heard gravel shift as her father stood. Next to him, her mother stood. Babayan and the dye mistress and the master spinner stood. In a moment, the whole tribe was on its feet. All of them would stand with the girl who could weave stone. Talia looked at each of them. She knew what a power like hers had not, that a power like hers had not been seen in generations, perhaps longer. They stood with her now, their love and trust surrounding her. But their worry was palpable. None among them heard the earth call as she did. As much as she loved these people, she did not see the one who could show her how to control the elemental magic that coursed within her. She knew that to stay with her tribe was to risk their lives. Though it pained all of them, Thalia said farewell to her parents and her people and set off alone into the world. She journeyed west toward the distant peak of Targon, her natural connection to rock drawing her toward the mountain that brushed the stars. However, at the mo northern edge of Shrima, it was those who marched beneath the banner of Noxus who discovered her power first. In Noxus, magic like hers was celebrated, they told her, revered even. They promised her a teacher. The land had raised Talia to be trusting, so she was unprepared for the smooth pr promises and practiced smiles of Noxian dignitaries. Soon the desert girl found herself on an unbending path passing under the many Nux Torah, the great iron gates that marked the empire's claim over a conquered land. The crush of people and the layers of politics within the capital city were claustrophobic to a girl from the open desert. Talia was paraded through the tiers of Noxian magical society. Many took an interest in her power, its potential, but it was a fallen captain who swore to take her to a wild place across the sea, a place where she could hone her abilities without fear, who made the most convincing case. She accepted the young officer's offer and crossed the sea to Ionia. However, it was made clear as their ship dropped anchor that she was intended as a glorified weapon for a man desperate to regain his place at the highest ranks of the Noxian navy. At dawn, the captain gave her a choice, bury a sleeping people in their homes or be discarded in the surf. 
Talia looked across the bay. The cooking smoke had not yet risen from the village's sleeping hearths. This was not the lesson she had come so far to learn. Talia refused, and the captain threw her overboard to drown. She escaped the tide and the fighting on the beach and found herself wandering lost in the wintry mountains of Ionia. It was there she finally discovered her teacher, a man whose blade harnessed the wind itself, someone who understood the elements and the need for balance. She trained with him for a time and began to find the control she had long sought. While resting at an isolated inn, Talia heard that the ascended emperor of Sharima had returned to his desert kingdom. Rumor had it this emperor turned god sought to gather his people. The disparate tribes backed to him as slaves. Even with her training unfinished, there was no other choice. She knew she must return to her family to protect them. Sadly, she and her mentor parted ways. Talia returned home to the sand-swept dunes of Sharima. As the punishing rays of the sun beat down on her, Talia pushed farther into the desert, determined to find her people. Hers was a will of stone, and she would do whatever was necessary to protect her family and her tribe from the danger that loomed on the horizon. Do not turn your back on what is right. So we get our look at Talia there, and we... Uh, if you're like me, you instantly thought of a certain Disney uh, female character that would be a great comparison, even though we're not to that part of the podcast yet, but just a little foreshadowing um, about what, who we're going to discuss later as far as being comparable to Talia in other other works, other media. Um, kind of was just right in my face the entire time. Uh, and then we get a hint at a new character that we haven't discussed uh, with Talia's uh, mentor that she finds in Ionia. They don't name the character, but uh, we will come to find that his name is Yasuo. Uh, he is like, you know, Tilly is a stone weaver. He's basically like a wind weaver, if you're going to use the term uh, weaver. Uh, that's not what he would use for himself, but he's a master of, of the wind, whereas she's learning to be a master of, of stone moving. And this next part is a little disjointed from what we usually do, but I, I want to start kind of giving more info on just the champions in general in terms of how they relate to the game. Um, and just to give context um, here about when um, these champions all were released. So Talia was released in May of 2016. Uh, and she is the latest, I believe. I don't think anyone that we're going to talk about later as far as Sharima goes, it has been released post uh, Talia, unless some of the very new ones have been Sharima, but I don't think they have. Um, and Azir, who, you know, Azir is the, the main dude here, and Sharima was released in September of 2014. And then the rest were released way earlier, way back, like when the game was just starting out. So Zerath was released in October of 2011, Renekton in January of 2011, Nasus in October 2009, and Sivir February of 2009. Sivir being a part of the original set of champions to be released when the game was released. So all the way back in 2009, so 12 years ago for Sivir. Uh, Tilia almost five years ago. So that's a long time to not be adding kind of to the to adding another champion kind of to this mix, I think um, they obviously have been updating the lore since then, so you can do whatever you want. It's not like you have to have a new champion to uh, to add to the lore of anything, but I just wanted to add that in there, and we'll do that each week. We'll kind of say when the champion was released, and and if I if there's other cool factoids about them, I'll try and add those in. Um, but yeah, so now we can jump into the story of Talia. It's called Echoes in the Stone, I believe. And we will 
read that. I think it's kind of short, and then we will jump into the uh, the comparisons for the week. If at first you don't succeed, throw another rock! Echoes in the stone. Talia was out running the sandstorm when she first noticed the water. In the beginning, it was faint, just a cool dampness she felt as she lifted the stones from deep beneath the sand. As she drew closer to old Sharima, wet streaks dripped from each new stone as if they were weeping. Talia knew the rock had stories to tell as she sped across the desert, but she didn't have time to listen to hear if there were tears of joy or sadness. When she was close enough to be covered by the shadow of the great sun disk, water from underground aquifers began to pour off the stone she rode like little rivers. And when she finally arrived at the gates, Talia heard the deafening water rushing along the bedrock. The oasis of the dawn, the mother of life, roared beneath the sands. The people of her tribe had followed the seasonal waters for hundreds of years. The best chance of finding her family was to follow the water, and to Talia's dismay, the water in Charima now flowed from a single source as it had in ages past. The tragic remains of the capital city had always been avoided, almost as much as the great Sai and deadly creatures that hunted there. Even thieves knew to keep their distance from the city, until now. Talia brought the rocks brought the rock she rode to a sudden halt, nearly stumbling from it as she pushed the stone quickly below the desert surface. She looked around. The women from Vakora had been right. This place was no longer a forgotten ruin, haunted by ghosts and sand. Indeed, the makeshift camp just outside the walls scrambled with life, like an anthill before a flood. Not knowing who these people were, she decided it might be best to reveal no more than was necessary. It seemed that there was tribal representation from all four corners of her homeland, but as Talia searched their faces, she saw none that were familiar. The people were torn. They argued about the merits of staying in their temporary camps versus seeking shelter within the city. Some worried that just as it rose, the city would fall again, burying any cot inside. Some saw the storm that bristled with unnatural lightning and thought their chances were better within the walls, even if the walls had once been lost to the sand for generations. All of them moved quickly, packing haphazardly and worriedly, glancing at the sky. Talia herself had won the race with the tempest, but it wouldn't be long before the sand lashed against the gates. Now is the time to decide, a woman called out to her, her voice almost lost to the noise of the churning oasis waters in the rising storm. Are you going in or leaving, girl? Talia turned to face the woman. She was Shereman, but other than that, unknown to her. I'm looking for my family, Talia gestured to her tunic. They're weavers. The Hawk Father has promised protection to all those within the walls, the woman said. Hawk Father? The woman looked at Talia's concerned face and smiled, taking her hand. Azir has returned to us, ascended. The oasis of the dawn flows again. A new day has come for Sharima. Talia, Talia looked around at the people. It, it was true. They were hesitant to move far into the massive capital, but the fear that worried their faces was more for the unnatural storm than the city or its returned emperor. The woman continued, There were weavers here this morning. They decided to wait out the storm inside. The woman pointed to the throngs of people pushing in toward the newly beating heart of Sharima. We must hurry. They are closing the gates. Talia found herself being pulled toward one of the capital's great gates by the woman, and driven from behind by a crowd of strangers who had decided at the last minute not to brave the sands by themselves. Still, there were a few groups clustered near the circled beasts, determined to face the storm as Shereem and caravans had for generations. In the distance, strange and threatening bolts of lightning crackled at the edge of the whirlwind. Old Shereem and traditions might not survive the storm's passing. Talia and the woman were pushed across the golden threshold that separated Sharima from the desert surrounding it. The heavy gates swung closed behind them with a resounding thud. The immensity of old Sharima's glory stretched out before them. The crowd hugged the thick, protective walls, unsure where to go. It was as if they sensed the empty streets belonged to someone else. I'm sure your people are somewhat, somewhere within the city. Most have kept close to the gates. Few are brave enough to go farther than that. I hope you find what you are looking for. The woman let go of Talia's hand and smiled. Water and shade to you, sister. Water and shade to you, Talia's voice dropped off as the woman disappeared into the milling crowd. The city that had been quiet for millennia now pulsed with life. Silently watching over Shreem's newest denizens were helmeted guards that wore desert cloaks in gold and crimson. 
Though there was no trouble, Talia continued to feel there was something not right about this place. Talia reached out to the thick wall to steady herself. She gasped. The stone throbbed beneath the flat of her palm. Pain, a terrible, blinding pain, overwhelmed her. Tens of thousands of voices were etched into the rock. The fear and torment of their last moments, before their lives were cut down and their shadows were seared into the stone, screamed in her mind. Talia tore her hand from the stone wall and stumbled. She had felt vibrations in stone before, reverberations of memories long since past, but never like this. The knowledge of what had come before felt her. Wild-eyed, she stood and stared, seeing the city anew. Revulsion washed over her. This wasn't a city reborn. It was an empty tomb risen from the sand. The last time Azir had made promises to the people of Sharima, it had cost them their lives. I must find my family, she whispered. The end. My journey is not yet at an end. So there we have it. We have the biography and the story for Talia. So she has returned to Sharima and to the capital city that Azir has just kind of brought up from the sands and looking for her family. Um, we know that she at some point is going to run into Sivir and Nasus. Nasus and Talia are going to help Sivir in her path uh, forward with Azir and Zarath and Renekton and then you know Talia is also going to be a member of this uh, storyline and she's going to have a role to play in in future battles and future struggles um, one thing that I do want to mention is that for the the um, riot based uh, game that's similar to Hearthstone if you know what Hearthstone is or other card based games um, called Legends of Runeterra that came out with a Shereman like expansion for it where they're adding Shereman characters and so if you like it it's actually great timing because the cinematic that they put out for it features basically all the characters that um, we have been talking about Tilly I don't think is in there but um like Nasus and Renekton and Azir, you can go and see all of those, like you know, and get a good view of what they would, what they look like, you know, moving around, and you know, we get to see Nasus and Renekton fight in it, and so it's actually just a great cinematic for what we're talking about, and so if you are interested in that, you can go check that out. Um, but now we can jump into the comparisons that we have for this week and the first one is a disney one which i don't think we've had a disney one yet i'm not but yeah i don't think we've used anybody from disney yet but um obviously when i was reading the biography and you know talia is got these powers and then she doesn't really know how to control them and then she's scaring you know all of the people uh, initially even though they all come around rather quickly compared to the person we're going to compare her to, but, um, you know, she's just so different from everybody else that it reminded me of, um, Elsa from Frozen, who has, you know, magical ice powers that everyone, everyone freaks out, and, you know, she goes and lives <laughs> in isolation and tries to, you know, harness those abilities and, like, fine-tune them and make it so she doesn't you know, inadvertently kill anyone that she doesn't want to, uh, just on accident with, you know, flying ice spears, and so Talia, that's what Talia needs to do also, and that's why she leaves, uh, her hometown, uh, her homeland, uh, her people, to go and try and learn, have somebody teach her how to control her powers, and then, then she meets Yasuo in Ionia after several attempts at finding a teacher within the Noxian Empire, and so yeah, that was kind of the first thing that jumped out to me was that her and Elsa share a very similar uh, trajectory, and they both have family that support them because you know Anna in Frozen is you know she's always wanting her sister to not be you know ashamed of what 
and she is and wants to you know build a snowman with her um never thought i'd be talking about frozen in this kind of situation uh I mean, I'm not a parent, so I didn't have it, re you know, played nonstop in, like, my house. But uh, I still find a lot of it annoying. And so, yeah, not much more to really say on that. Um, I guess they both kind of come back to in an attempt to save their people also, uh, if I'm remembering Frozen correctly. Uh, and then Talia, you know, she feels the need to, to save her family and to save the, the rest of the Weavers um, from what she thinks is Azir um, kind of returning and going to make everybody slaves again. I was going to play some <laughs> audio clips, I think, uh, it's from one of Elsa's songs. I think it's Let It Go, but I'm not going to do that to people, even though I do think that it works perfectly for uh, Talia's... Um, her mindset when she first discovers her powers, you know, and to not let the other people see them and just kind of pretend to be, you know, this girl who's going to weave cloth uh, for her people. And then secondly, we return also, I'm, I, I need to make, make a vow to, in our next uh, region that we <laughs> discussed to like not use any Game of Thrones uh, comparisons or characters uh, because, <laughs> because I think we're on number three or four right now but um, it's just a lot of things that just, I don't know, when I th am going through these champions in League I just always have these other characters from Game of Thrones in the back of my mind and ones that just fit, w that I think fit really well and so uh, for Talia, we're going to use um, Arya Stark. So she'd be the son of Eddard Stark. You're basically getting a really, you're basically getting a League Lore podcast and then also a Game of Thrones podcast with how much I talk about Game of Thrones and how much I have to explain <laughs> uh, the characters. But so we've talked about Eddard Stark uh, or Ned Stark, uh, the Warden of the North and Hand of the King in previous podcasts. So his daughter, Arya Stark is someone who she doesn't have magical powers um, per se uh, in the traditional sense that we think about it but for a woman during this time she is very much into fighting and combat and killing people and so that is very much against the norm of what women do in the Game of Thrones society it's very medieval very much you know male dominated they're the ones that do the fighting and but she is like a through training she becomes a very skilled uh swordsman and but what she also does is she leaves home she leaves the entire continent after her, i mean after basically her entire family is massacred she leaves and sails to uh bravos the city of bravos and she starts training to become what are known as the faceless men and what a faceless man is is somebody who can take the face and shape of another person as, as a disguise and it's seamless you don't ever know that it's a faceless man unless they reveal themselves to you um, and it's it, I mean, it's basically a kind of, of magic that they're able to do this, even though it c costs people their lives to be able to take on the form of another person to take their face. So she leaves home and she's, you know, searching for the people to teach her this. And then she comes to the House of Black and White, which is the, the name of the place where the faceless man and the faceless men train. And she, you know, has her teacher there. And... He's gone by many names, and uh, so, I mean, kind of just like how they don't name Yasuo in the lore for Talia, that this guy, he has n many names, so in a way he has no names, and that is kind of their whole, their whole vibe there is that if you're a faceless man, you have, you have no name. You are no one, and then after 
a certain amount of time and events happening um, and th things happening with what's the rest of her family back uh, in their home to uh, Arya decides to uh, go back to Westeros and to make good on promises that she has made to herself in terms of people that she's going to go and murder and I think that there is a good um, audio clip from when she decides to return home that I'm going to play uh, that I think coincides with uh, Talia's decision to to return home from uh, the mountains uh, of Ionia. Finally, a girl is Noah. A girl is Arya Stark of Winterfell. And I'm going home. Talia doesn't uh, hate her mentor in the end like Arya does. Um, I think it's probably pretty hard to leave. Yes, well, after he teaches her everything um, that she needs. Um, but yeah, so those are the ones that we're going to use for Talia. And that does it for this episode of League Lore and More. Like I said at the beginning, only a couple more weeks of this. And then Sharima will be all wrapped up. But I'm sure it will bleed into the other regions as we talk about them. It, other regions have already bled into Sharima's lore, so that's the way it goes. Um, again, if you want visual aids for this, these will be uploaded to YouTube, but it usually it takes a few days um, after I upload them to Spotify or Apple Podcasts for me to be able to finish um, creating the, uh, the YouTube video for them and then uploading them so you can check at some point during the week to see if it's up uh, on my channel on youtube or you can just search for funky odor or it would probably probably be easier to search for the uh titles of the of the episodes but uh regardless thank you all for listening and we will be back next week with um a, a discussion that breaks off from this storyline uh, there are a few remaining characters, champions uh, from Sharima that don't necessarily interact with these people uh, in the way that in, in this such a personal way that uh, these first uh, what five, six characters have all all their storylines are starting to be interwoven uh, together uh, so come back next week to see who we will be discussing, and uh, I'll see you guys then.